For most simple aldehydes and ketones, aldol addition is either outright thermodynamically favorable or at least reversible, meaning close to thermoneutral. And to understand this, we can start by thinking about the difference in pKa between the conjugate acids of the anions that we have on one side, an enolate, and the other side, an alkoxide. The conjugate acid of an enolate is, of course, the neutral car carbonyl compound, and the pKa there for an aldehyde or ketone is roughly 16 to 20. Let's put it at 18 for an aldehyde or ketone on average. The conjugate acid of an alkoxide is an alcohol, and the pKa here tends to be somewhat lower, about 15. So based on these pKa's, we can conclude that we're going from a less stable to a more stable anion, assuming the neutral molecules are roughly equal in stability. Now we do have a reorganization of bonds that goes on here. A carbon-oxygen pi bond is cleaved in the electrophilic starting material and we formed a carbon-carbon sigma bond. And that can be a thermoneutral or even a little bit disfavored process. However, on the whole, these additions can usually be either rendered reversible or made favorable. And in particular, if we drive the addition all the way through condensation, if we eliminate water after the addition process, we end up with a four atom delocalized conjugated system. And this process is far and away favoring the product side because of the resonance delocalization in this product. And so the condensation ultimately is irreversible. If we give this reaction enough time, and for example, raise the temperature, we're going to go all the way to the unsaturated aldehyde or ketone product spontaneously. An important exception to this general idea comes in for strongly sterically hindered aldol products like the one you see right here. Here we have two very bulky tert-butyl groups attached to the alpha carbons of the electrophile and nucleophile. And this creates a situation in which there is steric bumping between these two very bulky groups in the aldol addition product. Under these circumstances, the aldol, the aldol reaction can and often does happen in reverse spontaneously, and this is called retroaldol cleavage. Retroaldol cleavage is the reverse of aldol addition, so it's an elimination process. Really, the key step is beta elimination, which reestablishes a carbon-oxygen pi bond and regenerates an enolate. This is a retroaldol under basic conditions. Under acidic conditions, we would end up with an enol, but the idea is conceptually similar. The reason this process is favored in the forward direction is because of the steric hindrance on the reactant side. We've relieved this destabilizing interaction between the electron clouds of the tert-butyl groups by separating the molecules in space. Retroaldol reactions also show up in biochemical contexts, and one of the most important occurs in glycolysis. The metabolite fructose 1,6-bisphosphate contains the beta-hydroxycarbonyl functionality that's needed for a retroaldol reaction to occur. The retroaldol of this intermediate gives rise to two fragmented products, as we would expect. One is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and the other is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The basic purpose of this step is to convert a six carbon fragment, six carbons because this intermediate was derived from glucose, into two three carbon fragments, each of which is individually carried on through the remainder of glycolysis. We'll look at the details of this in a future video series on glycolysis, but I wanted to mention it here as a very important biochemical example of a retroaldol reaction. The synthetic utility of the aldol reaction really comes from the fact that it forms a carbon-carbon bond between two key atoms within carbonyl compounds, a nucleophilic alpha carbon and an electrophilic carbonyl carbon, which becomes a beta carbon in the product of aldol addition or condensation. So aldol reactions can be used to synthesize either beta-hydroxyketones, these are the products of aldol addition, or alpha-beta unsaturated ketones, which are the products after water is eliminated from an initially formed beta-hydroxyketohyde in an aldol condensation. And the beauty of the aldol reaction is that we retain reactivity in the product, so we can elaborate the products further into even more complex organic molecules. In the product of aldol addition, we have a hydroxyl group that remains in the product. And this is part of an alcohol functional group 
that it can undergo further reactivity. We also retain a carbonyl group, and so, for example, nucleophilic additions to this carbonyl group are still an option. In the product of aldol condensation, we also have that carbonyl carbon hanging around, but in addition, we have a newly unsaturated beta carbon, which can also be electrophilic. I'll just mention this for now, but we'll look at the electrophilic reactivity of the beta carbon in much more detail in a future video. If we want to think about how to plan syntheses using aldol reactions, we really need to think backwards from these products to the starting materials required to make them, and this requires thinking retrosynthetically. To do this, I want to start with the product of aldol addition and analyze the product to identify the nature of the starting materials that would have to be used to make it. The first thing we should recognize about this aldol addition product is that the carbon-carbon bond that was formed as a result of the reaction is this one I'm highlighting in green. Between an alpha carbon of one of the carbonyl molecules and the carbonyl carbon of the other. And with the colors here, I'm matching our usual use of red for the nucleophile and blue for the electrophile. To draw the reactants used to generate this product, we simply disconnect this carbon-carbon bond, pushing the electrons, at least mentally, back toward this alpha carbon, and then imagining protonating that resulting enolate to generate the neutral ketone, or as in this case, aldehyde starting material. So, the nucleophilic molecule is this, and in this particular situation, the electrophilic molecule is exactly the same. To generate that, we imagine deprotonating this hydroxyl and using the OH electrons to form a CO pi bond. This is essentially running the addition step in reverse, is a nice way to think about it. This produces the aldehyde shown here, and these two can be combined, for example, in the presence of a base, to generate the aldol addition product after acidic workup. Analysis of the aldol condensation product is similar, but is a little bit trickier to see since water is eliminated from the electrophilic component of the reaction. So one thing we need to do is first, again, identify the key bond that's formed. It's still between the alpha carbon of one of the molecules and the carbonyl carbon of the other, but the carbonyl carbon of the electrophilic component is a little bit more difficult to see since water was eliminated to generate this double bond. So imagine the hydroxyl group here. Imagine the initially formed aldol addition product. After the elimination of water, we would be left with a double bond between the alpha and beta carbons. And that's what we're seeing here. So just like in the case below, the electrophilic carbon is the beta carbon in the aldol condensation product and the nucleophilic carbon is the alpha carbon with respect to the carbonyl group that remains in the product of aldol condensation. To generate the reactants needed to make this aldol condensation product, we again imagine fragmenting or cleaving the bond between the alpha and beta carbons, introducing a carbonyl group at the electrophilic beta carbon and imagining the alpha carbon as saturated here with two hydrogens. And so in this example, we end up with one of the components being this aldehyde. And in fact, the other component is the exact same aldehyde. And you can verify this on your own. So both of these amount to dimerization processes with the same aldehyde reacting in both a nucleophilic and an electrophilic role. If you haven't seen this arrow with two bolded lines and kind of an open structure like this, if you haven't seen this before, we can read this as can be made from or is derived from. So we could say, for example, that this alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde is derived from dimerization of these aldehyde molecules or reaction of this aldehyde with itself. 